Hi, this is Sarit Switzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 252 for the 4th of Av in the leap year. So you most likely have heard the famous story, originally taken from Aesop's fables, called The Boy Who Cried Wolf. If you haven't yet heard this story, or if you had, have, and you need a little bit of a refresher, then here we go. I'm going to remind you guys of what the story is. So the story goes that there was once a young shepherd boy who was tending to his flock of sheep, and he was feeling kind of bored. It was a pretty boring day, and he was feeling very lonely. So he decided to do a little prank, and he started to scream out, wolf, 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 as if there was a wolf there. And lo and behold, it worked, and people started to come in a panic and came to his rescue. And there was no wolf there, alas, but nevertheless, he got his excitement for the day. And the people in the village that came to him berated him, and they said, you know, you really can't do this. A wolf is a really serious thing, and please don't do this again. And they left. And then a little time went by, and... A few days after that, once again, the boy was feeling very bored and lonely. So once again, he did the same prank. He started screaming, wolf, wolf, even though there was no wolf. And all the villagers came to try to help out this boy. And they saw that once again, there was no wolf. And they got very angry. And they said, you know, you really can't do this anymore. And the boy said, okay, okay, I won't do this anymore. And so then lo and behold, a few days later, there actually was a wolf, a true wolf. And the wolf came, and the boy got very scared and petrified, especially because he saw the wolf coming to approach his sheep. And he cried out, wolf, wolf. But at this point, the villagers no longer believed him, and they did not come to his rescue. And the wolf ended up eating a good chunk of his sheep and his flock. And the boy ended up running to the village, crying and weeping and telling the story. And eventually, when they checked, they saw that this indeed was true, and that the sheep really did, the boy's sheep really did get slaughtered by the wolf. And they said to the boy, they said, you know, listen, like if a liar, if a, if a person lies enough time, then they won't be believed even when they tell the truth. And this was a lesson for the boy for the rest of his life. And this is a lesson to people, to kids reading this book and adults, that you really should be an honest person so people will trust you when it's really needed. So why am I bringing this up? Because this very much, we can relate to this in terms of what we've been talking about. About uh, yesterday, we started talking about this idea of forgiveness and God forgiving and man forgiving and the whole idea of like, what happens if you do a wrongdoing to somebody? And if you, uh, if you do something wrong to somebody, whether it's God or whether it's to man, and then you go and you ask for forgiveness, then we know that according to Torah, then we are supposed to forgive the person immediately when a person comes to us. And we learn that this is so much the case that if you approach somebody and ask for forgiveness three times and they don't forgive you, you don't actually need to persist in, in asking for forgiveness anymore because that's something that a human person, being should do. And we talked about how this, when it comes to God, then this all the more so when it comes to God, God is all forgiving, all embracing. So it's like if we ask God for forgiveness immediately, then God will immediately forgive us. Today, we're going to really talk about why we praise God in this way, Why, if, if this is something, if this is a trait that even humans are supposed to have, that we're supposed to forgive people immediately, what's so special about this trait when it comes to God? And to me, I think the best way to understand this and how, how we'll understand this in the Tanya is by looking at the story of the boy who cried wolf. Because even the most nicest person in the world, who is really a very forgiving and merciful kind of person, 
if a person, if the same person keeps hurting them over and over and over and over, if a person keeps lying to them or doing something deceptive or doing something wrong to a person, okay, sure, if they come to you and plead for forgiveness one time, great. If you're a nice person, you'll forgive them. They do it again, maybe you'll forgive them again. A third time, maybe again. But at a certain point, we'd most likely call this an abusive relationship, right? Like if somebody keeps doing something wrong to you and you keep forgiving them, I mean, at a certain point, enough is enough for anybody in the world, even the nicest person in the world, most likely. However, what we'll learn about when it comes to God, that God really is truly infinitely merciful. And while we don't want to be the boy who cries wolf, and we'll learn about that also, that it actually doesn't really work if we're doing this intentionally, if we sort of like intentionally uh, decide in our minds that, you know what, God is infinitely forgiving. So like, like just like the boy like put too much trust in the villagers and he said, oh, these villagers are so nice, they'll believe anything I say. So I could cry wolf today, it's true, it's not true, whatever, they'll come to my rescue. The same thing with God. It's like if we play with God in this way, if we say, oh, you know what? I know God is infinitely forgiving, so I'm just going to sin today. I'm going to do whatever I want because I can always go back and ask for forgiveness later. It doesn't really work. God's on to you, <laughs> so that's not going to work. However, if we're sincere and if you really, really do uh, regret what you did and you really do approach God sincerely for repentance, then there is no limit, and you can actually do this an infinite amount of times. And even to the point, as we'll learn, that even if you do say, I'm going to go sin and then ask for repentance later, well, it may not be so easy, and it might not be like lechatchila, like, like before the fact, the right thing to do, there is still a way to repent. There's always, always room for repentance. It's not like the boy who cried wolf, who the villagers will not come, come to you. Maybe it's true that mortal man will at a certain point put a limit on their forgiveness. But when it comes to God, there is no limit. God will infinitely forgive you. There's always a door open for forgiveness to approach God in that way. So let's get into the text and see how the Alter Rebbe explains this. And for context, we are in the middle of chapter 11 of the Yerusha Tshuva, the penultimate chapter, the uh, chapter right before the last chapter. So here we go. So the Alter Rebbe begins leaving off from last time where we talked about this idea about how, how it is that we know definitely uh, with, with um, certainty that God's going to forgive us is that we say this in our prayers. We say, in our prayers, we say, forgive us for we have sinned. And then right after that, we bless God for saying that he is the merciful God who forgives, who is abundant in forgiveness. So we're basically saying with certainty that God is a forgiving God and God will forgive us from our sins. And we can be assured of this when we when we pray, when we approach God for forgiveness. And so now the altar is kind of asking a question here. He says, why is it that we're praising God in this kind of way, like that, that he's so forgiving? Like we talked about the fact that man should also be forgiving. So it's like what makes God so special? If, if a person is supposed to forgive just like that also, what's so special about God? And we see that this is in the in uh, in Ezra, the altar says that this idea of rav lisloch. What does this mean about that Hashem abundant is abundant in His forgiveness? This means that in contrast to a mortal person, if a person were to sin to, towards another person, and then ask him for forgiveness, and then the person the, the second person were to forgive him. And then afterwards, the person would go back and repeat it again. So imagine, let's think of a, a very concrete scenario. Let's say, let's think about a marriage. Let's think about a, a husband who acts in, a, in an abusive way towards his wife. So let's say he hits his wife. <laughs> let's be really extreme, right? And let's say that the wife, she realizes he was in a really bad state, whatever, you know, and then she goes and she forgives him. Okay, that was like a one-time offense. Let's say he goes back and he does it again then after doing it again, it's going to be really hard. Even if the husband grovels down on his knees, that second time that he hits her, it's going to be a lot harder to forgive him. All the more so if he does this a third time, a fourth time, right? It's like at a certain point, enough is enough. And the woman, anybody, any rational person would say that she would be really uh, an idiot and, and really there'd be something wrong with her if she would just stay in such a marriage. However, when it comes to God, then there is no difference between one time and a thousand times. Because forgiveness comes from the attribute of mercy. And 
the and when it comes to God's attributes, there is no limit to God's attributes because they are all infinite in nature. So it's like our our um, attributes basically are limited. So we're talking about this extreme example of like a husband beating his wife, but even like on a more subtle level, let's let's say you have a friend who keeps doing something to you that is not so nice. Like let's say you find out that your friend said something not so nice about you behind your back and then the friend asks for forgiveness and you forgive them and then they do it again and you forgive them again and then they do it again and they for you forgive them again. Even if you know that they're being sincere every time they approach you for forgiveness, at a certain point, it's like even, it's, it's like you don't have an infinite amount of mercy. It's not, it's like how much can you give to them already, you know? But when it comes to God, God's attributes are not like our attributes. Our attributes are limited. We have a certain amount of mercy that we can give. When it comes to God, his mercy is infinite because all of his attributes are infinite. And we see a proof of this from Echa, chapter 3, verse 22, where it says, Ki lo chamav, that his mercies have not ended. And so when it comes to infinity, if we're talking about infinity, which is what we're talking about when it comes to God's attributes, there's no difference between a small number and a big number. So whether a person comes and asks for forgiveness one time or a thousand times, it's all the same because everything is like not. A thousand is just as nothing to God as one is. And we see uh, this hinted at in, uh, in davening, in R Rosh Hashanah davening, where we say, katan which means that Hashem makes equal small and big. It's all the same to him. And so this is why we can understand that when we look at the prayers for Yom Kippur, it says, that every year Hashem removes our, our guilt. Every single year. So it's like again and again, like every Yom Kippur we approach God with all of our sins, all of the transgressions we did, all the mistakes we did, but yet year after year after year Hashem cleanses us completely no matter how many times we repeat the same sin over and over and over. And we see this from the fact that like the blessing that we say, the al Khet blessing, is the same blessing. Like it's like we, there's a whole list that we use on Yom Kippur, if you're familiar with that, where we list a whole bunch of sins that we did. And so that list is the same list year after year after year. So there's an assumption that we're, we did these same sins. We engaged in these same sins, maybe in a different way, maybe on a different level or whatever, but the same sins over and over. Like we wouldn't say it if we didn't do it on some level. And so even though every year we go back and we, we transgress these same sins, we once again go back and we, uh, we confess them on Yom Kippur, and we do this over and over throughout our entire life. And not only every year does this imply, does this apply, like it's not just like once a year we do a sin and then we go and we get a tone for it on Yom Kippur, but actually three times a day. Like when we say the Amida prayer, the Shemun prayer, we, part of that Shmonesra prayer, which we say three times per day, is Hashem Hanun is this bracha of blessed are you God, the merciful one who is abundant in forgiveness, which means we have something that needs forgiveness, which means every single day every, between each prayer, we're still engaging in some ty type of inappropriate behavior, some type of something that's not to our fullest extent of who we could be that like we're transgressing we're transgressing something we're doing something that's not ideal and we need to ask for forgiveness again so we actually ask for forgiveness three times a day from god so it's a lot think about that like in the grand scope of things every day every week every year it's a lot of asking for forgiveness and so now this the sages taught and this is from the gemara in brachas 26a that when we are praying what is prayer prayer is actually a substitute for the sacrificial offerings, specifically the tamid offerings that we would give in the temple, which were these daily sacrificial offerings. And there was a sacrificial offering that we would give in the morning. Um, and the sacrificial offering that we would give in the morning, that would atone for the transgressions that a person did at night. And the sacrificial offering that we would give in the evening would atone for whatever sins we did during the day. And so too, day by day, every day. So this was the same thing. So just like we pray every day now, three times a day, over and over, and it's this repetitive kind of ritual. So back in the day, when we at the temple, we would give these um, sacrifices, and it would be a daily thing. It would be also very perpetual. And then, so what's the difference? And then you can ask yourself, okay, so if we're asking for forgiveness every day with the three times a day prayer, what's the difference between that? Why do we need Yom Kippur? What's Yom Kippur about? So Yom Kippur, is, uh, that, is, that atones for the really serious, severe transgressions. 
And the tamid, which was this uh, korban tamid, this sacrificial tamid, which was an ola offering, this would only uh, atone for the positive commandments. And so, so too now when we pray, this prayer is uh, together with tshuva, is likened to this Ola offering, this Tamid offering that we would get, give. It, it also has to do with the positive commandments. So it's not, when we when we pray three, three times a day, what we're asking for forgiveness for is for neglect in positive commandments. But when it comes to the negative commandments and the more severe type of things, that we really need to wait till Yom Kippur. And, okay, so now going back to prayer and going back to this thing that we say three times a day we're asking for forgiveness. So a person might say that this, doesn't this fall into the category of achateva shuv, which is that like I will sin and then I will do tshuva. So this is an idea that's brought up in the Gemara in Masachet Yoma, page 85b, where it, there's this idea that if a person says like if they rely on tshuva in or, uh, for them to sin, their their tshuva is not accepted. So it's like let's say if a person says to themselves, you know, I'm really hungry right now, and there's a sandwich right in front of me, and like. I know I'm supposed to say bracha, but I don't care. I'm just going to eat the sandwich right now without saying a bracha, without benching. And I'll make it up later. I'll just, I'll just do tshuva. What's the big, big deal? So that's not allowed. And it says that, like, there's this idea that if um, if a person does this, if a person sins with the idea, with the thought in mind that they'll go back and do tshuva later, then it says that the opportunity to repent will not come to them. And must be kinu. So it's, it will not be brought to them the opportunity to repent. So what does this mean? So now the altar of that elaborates on this and he, he explains this in a little bit more detail. He says, okay, this is talking about a situation where at the moment that a person is sinning, they could have overcome their Yitzhahara, but they're just relying on Shuva. So it's like, again, the person's super hungry and it's like, they could say the bracha. They could, if they really worked on themselves, if they really just took a moment to breathe and you know had a little bit more patience, they could have said that bracha. But they didn't, and they just said to themselves, I'm, I, whatever, I'm just going to eat the sandwich, and then I'll do tshuva later. And so that means, in that case, it's actually the tshuva caused them to sin, if you think about it. Because it's like, because they're relying on tshuva, because they're saying to themselves, I could just do tshuva later, that's what's causing them not to say the bracha right now. But, however, says the ultra rabbi, even if they're not granted the opportunity to do tshuva. This idea of en maspikinlo is the language of the Gemara, that it's not, they're not given the opportunity. It's like it's not brought to them in this readily way. If they really, really push and they're really strong, then, and they can really overcome their Zahara and then they do tshuva, their tshuva is nevertheless accepted. So again, so in this scenario, let's say somebody is super hungry and they say to themselves, you know what, I'm just gonna eat this food. I'm not gonna say a bracha now. I'll just do tshuva later. So if that really happens in the moment, but then later on, they come to this realization and they come to this sense of remorse and they really do do tshuva and they really are like, wow, I should not have done that. I should not have relied on tshuva. They can still get to the point where their tshuva is accepted. And so, okay, so now the altar of it brings up a question. He says that every day when we say this prayer of slach lanu, forgive us, we preface this prayer by saying, which means bring us back with a perfect repentance before you, meaning so that we will, like, meaning to say that we want to go back to a place like where we will not get, not fall anymore. So, like, it's like we're basically saying to God, I'm so sorry I'm, I, I did that. Please bring me back to how I was before. And I am. I'm uh, asserting right now, I'm making a resolution that I will not do this again. And so too on Yom Kippur, where we say, that we say, maybe your will that I sin no more. Like we're asking God to really, really make us, make us strong so that we don't sin anymore. And in this case, then God readily accepts his tshuva, for sure. And it's like the opportunity is most definitely granted, no matter what. Um, as we see that the sages taught, and this is from the Gemara in two places, where it says in, in Shabbos, Masechel Shabbos, page 104a, and in Yoma, page 38b, where it says, Habalater Masi'inoto, that a person who comes to purify themselves, he's given assistance in this. And the Altar Abba really points out this word, Habba, whoever comes, meaning as soon as they come. And so this pardon and forgiveness is given to them immediately. So that's the end of the section. And so just to kind of break this down, that down and bring it back to the boy who cried wolf, is that the amazing thing about God 
and it really is big in big part in large part because God really knows what's going on on the inside for us which was not the case with the farmers with the villagers uh, and the boy but God knows if we're sincere or not and if we really really are sincere it doesn't matter if we sin a million times because we will sin a million times that's the nature of being human it doesn't that doesn't give us the excuse that doesn't give us like the carte blanche to just go out and do whatever we want and say you know what I'm just going to do chuva later that's not how we should live we really need to work on ourselves to the best of our abilities and hopefully like the better you become throughout your life hopefully you're moving in a certain direction so that your sins even become more refined so to speak so it's like you're not it's not anymore about like maybe you start off like maybe you start off where the challenge for you is not to eat a cheeseburger and then the challenge for you is like not to uh, forget to say a bracha before you eat eat a regular kosher meal and then maybe the challenge for you is to have the proper kavana proper intention before you say that bracha so it's like we are constantly growing like it's not something we need to be despondent about hopefully if you're constantly doing shiva you're growing and becoming better nevertheless there's always more growth and there's always times that we fall and and we are going to fall because we're human but god unlike man has the infinite capacity to forgive so it's not like the boy who cried wolf like yes we are the boy who cried wolf in a certain sense but it doesn't matter because when it comes to god god is not like a man who like enough is enough and it's like okay you asked for forgiveness too many times i can't handle this anymore for god it's infinite and he is all embracing all encompassing in his forgiveness so it's it's nice to think of that um, hopefully that leads you on a positive optimistic note and we will continue and conclude this chapter tomorrow i'll speak to you then thanks for listening to the it is top podcast hosted by sarit switzer this podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather avraham yitzhak ben binyamin cohen of blessed memory music by shoshana if you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.